All right, good morning, guys. Thanks for coming. We are starting the Vishnu Purana today. Um, so there's something cool about the Vishnu Purana in particular that I want to share before we get into it. Um, we discussed which Purana to commence after the Bhagavatam. There were a few people made suggestions, but um, the Vishnu Purana is what we, um, what people ended up wanting to go with, what the most people ended up wanting to go with. Um, the, an interesting thing about the Vishnu Purana, so it's fairly well known that in um, many of the different Puranas, the same stories or similar stories often occur, um, sometimes with slight differences. The Puranas actually address this uh, this subject of the differences between different Puranas and give an explanation of it. Um, the most detailed explanation of it is given in the Matsya Purana, in um, Matsya Purana Discourse 53, um, which talks about Kalpa Bheda theory. The, the, the fact that, that in the different Kalpas, the different time cycles, which we have read about um, in the Bhagavata Purana, um, the same great events, many of the same great events tend to occur kalpa after kalpa, but not in identical ways. The same patterns of karma occur, but with slightly different manifestations. Um, and different Puranas are describing the event as it occurred in different kalpas. And that implies that a great significance to the idea of which Purana describes the current Kalpa. Um, because by implication, that Purana should be more accurate and more applicable currently to us than all of the others. And the Matsya Purana in Discourse 53 of that one lists all of the Puranas, the 18 Mahapuranas, and it even lists many Upapuranas, because there's a lot more than 18. The 18 Mahapuranas are the, are the great 18 Puranas um, that were taught by um, Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa, but there are many more. Um, and it lists each one, a lot of information about each one, including what Kalpa it refers to. And it's not always one-to-one. -one. Some Puranas refer to multiple Kalpas and so on. Um, but it does go through and list them. And interestingly, it does not, the Matsya Purana does not praise itself as the foremost of Puranas. It specifically praises some other ones as superior to it in its own opinion. Um, so there is unanimous, as for what Kalpa we are currently in, it's, there is unanimous accord on that. Um, the pundits of every lineage, any temple in India at the beginning of every yajna, they chant the kalpa to locate the yajna in time and, and place as well. Everyone agrees that the present kalpa is called the Shveta Varaha kalpa, um, literally the eon of the white boar, and named after um, Vishnu's Varaha avatar, which occurred in the present kalpa. And the Matsya Purana going through lists that the Purana describing the Varaha Kalpa, the present Kalpa, is the Vishnu Purana. And so the Vishnu Purana holds a special place among Puranikas generally, um, among some more even than the Bhagavatam, in being the most applicable to our present cycle. And so in context of us starting in on the Vishnu Purana, I kind of wanted to explain that special significance about it. Um, that in theory, according to the Puranika school, anywhere the Vishnu Purana differs from the Bhagavatam or any other Purana, the Vishnu Purana presently has the highest authority. So, the Vishnu Puranam, book one, chapter one. In this translation, we're using chapter, where in the previous translation we used discourse. Um, but they're both translating the Sanskrit word dhyaya, so it's the same thing. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om, glory to Vasudeva. Victory be to you, Pundari Kaksha. Adoration be to you, Vishvabhavana, 
Glory be to you, Hrishikesha, Mahapurusha, and Purvaja. These are, of course, all names of Vishnu. Um, Pundarikaksha, having eyes like a lotus. Um, Pundarika, supreme imperishable glory. Vishvabhavana, the creator of the universe, the cause of the existence of all things. Hrishikesha, lord of the senses. Mahapurusha, the great supreme spirit. Purvaja, um, that which appeared before the first birth, the unborn fullness. May that Vishnu, who is the existent imperishable Brahman, who is Ishvara, who is spirit, who with the three gunas is the cause of creation, preservation, and destruction, who is the parent of nature, intellect, and the other ingredients of the universe, be to us the bestower of understanding, wealth, and final emancipation. Having adored Vishnu, the Lord of all, and paid reverence to Brahma and the rest, having also saluted the spiritual guru, I will narrate a Purana equal in sanctity to the Vedas. Maitreya, having saluted him reverentially, thus addressed Parashara, the excellent sage, the grandson of Vasishta, who was versed in traditional history and the Puranas, who was acquainted with the Vedas and the branches of science dependent upon them, and skilled in law and philosophy, and who had performed the morning rites of devotion. Um, you might remember Maitreya from our reading of the Bhagavatam. This is the same sage Maitreya who narrated a large portion of the Bhagavatam around um, books, I think four or five or so of the Bhagavatam. Um, this is the same sage Maitreya addressing his Guru Parashara. Maitreya said, Master, I have been instructed by you in the whole of the Vedas and in the institutes of law, the Dharma Shastras, and of sacred science. Through your favor, other men, even though they be my foes, cannot accuse me of having been remiss in the acquirement of knowledge. I am now desirous, O oh you who are profound in piety, to hear from you how this world was and how in future it will be. What is its substance, O Brahman, and whence proceed animate and inanimate things? Into what has it been resolved, and into what will its dissolution occur again? How were the elements manifested? Whence proceeded the gods and other beings? What are the situation and extent of the oceans and the mountains, the earth, the sun, and the other planets? What are the families of the gods and others, the Manus, the periods called Manvantaras, the periods termed Kalpas, and their subdivisions, and the four Yugas, the events that happen at the close of a Kalpa, and the terminations of the several ages. The histories, O great Muni of the gods, the sages and kings. Um, and how the Vedas were divided into branches or schools after they had been arranged by Vyasa. The duties of the Brahmanas and, and the other tribes as well as of those who pass through the different orders of life. All these things I wish to hear from you, grandson of Vasishta. Incline your thoughts benevolently towards me that I may through your favor be informed of all I desire to know. Parashara replied, well inquired, pious Maitreya. You recall to my recollection that which was of old narrated by my father's father, Vasishta. I had heard that my father had been devoured by Irakshasa, employed by Vishvamitra. Violent anger seized me, and I commenced to sacrifice for the destruction of the Rakshasas. Hundreds of them were reduced to ashes by the right, when, as they were about to be entirely extirpated, my grandfather Vasishta thus spoke to me. Enough, my child, let your wrath be appeased. The Rakshasas are not culpable. Your father's death was the work of destiny. Anger is the passion of fools. It becomes not a wise man. By whom, it may be asked, is anyone killed? Every man reaps the consequences of his own acts. Anger, my son, is the destruction of all that man obtains by arduous exertions of fame and of devout austerities and prevents the attainment of heaven or of emancipation. The chief sages always shun wrath. Be not you, my child, subject to its influence. Let no more of these unoffending spirits of darkness be consumed. Mercy is the might of the righteous. Being thus admonished by my venerable grandsire, I immediately desisted from the right in obedience to his injunctions. 
and Vasishta, the most excellent of sages, was connected with me. Then arrived Pulastya, the son of Brahma, one of the uh, mind-born sons of Brahma, as you will recall from the Bhagavatam, who was received by my grandfather with the customary marks of respect. The illustrious brother of Pulaha, Pulastya, said to me, since in the violence of animosity you have listened to the words of your progenitor and have exercised clemency, therefore you shall become learned in every science, since you have forborne, even though incensed, to destroy my posterity. He says my posterity because Pulastya, uh, Pulastya Prajapati, one of the great progenitors of the different orders of life, is the progenitor of the Rakshasa race. I will bestow upon you another boon, and you shall become the author of a summary of the Puranas. You shall know the true nature of the deities as it really is, and whether, whether engaged in religious rites or abstaining from their performance, your understanding through my favor shall be perfect and exempt from doubts. Then my grandsire Vasishta added, whatever has been said to you by Pulastya shall assuredly come to pass. Now truly all that was told me formerly by Vasishta and by the wise Pulastya has been brought to my recollection by your questions, and I will relate to you the whole, even all you have asked. Listen to this complete compendium of the Puranas according to its tenor. The world was produced from Vishnu, it exists in him, he is the cause of its continuance and cessation, he is the world. And so that right there, in a nutshell, was the complete answer to all of Maitreya's questions. But of course, uh, Parashara is going to go on to answer in very lengthy detail. Chapter two, Parashara said, glory to the unchangeable, holy, eternal, supreme Vishnu of one universal nature, the mighty over all, to him who is Hiranyagarbha, Hari and Shankara, the creator, the preserver, and destroyer of the world, to Vasudeva, the liberator of his worshipers, to him whose essence is both single and manifold, who is both subtle and corporeal, indiscreet and discreet, to Vishnu, the cause of final emancipation. Glory to the supreme Vishnu, the cause of the creation, existence, and end of this world, who is the root of the world and who consists of the world. Having glorified him who is the support of all things, who is the smallest of the small, who is in all created things, the unchanged, imperishable Purushottama, who is one with true wisdom, as truly known, eternal and incorrupt, and who is known through false appearances by the nature of visible objects. Having bowed to Vishnu, the destroyer and lord of creation and preservation, the ruler of the world, unborn, imperishable, undecaying, I will relate to you that which was originally imparted by the great father of all, Brahma, in answer to the questions of Daksha and other venerable sages, and repeated by them to Purukutsa, a king who reigned on the banks of the Narmada River. It was next related by him to Sarasvata, and by Sarasvata to me, Parashara. Who can describe him who is not to be apprehended by the senses? who is the best of all things, the supreme soul, self-existent, who is devoid of all the distinguishing characteristics of complexion, caste, or the like, and is exempt from birth, vicissitude, death, or decay, who is always and alone, who exists everywhere, and in whom all things here exist, and who is thence named Vasudeva. He is Brahma, supreme, Lord, eternal, unborn, imperishable, undecaying, of one essence, ever pure as free from defects. He that Brahman was all things, comprehending in his own nature the indiscreet and discreet, he then existed in the forms of Purusha and of Kala. Purusha, or spirit, is the first form of the supreme. Next proceeded two other forms, the discreet and indiscreet, and Kala, or time, was the last, setting it into motion. These four, Pradhana, the primary matter, Purusha, the spirit, Vyakta, visible substance, and Kala, time, 
the wise consider to be the pure and supreme condition of Vishnu. These four forms in their due proportions are the causes of the production of the phenomena of creation, preservation, and destruction. Vishnu being thus discrete and indiscrete substance, spirit, and time, sports like a playful boy, as you shall learn by listening to his frolics. That chief principle, pradhana, which is the indiscrete cause, is called by the sages also by the name of prakriti, or nature. It is subtle, uniform, and comprehends what is and what is not, or both causes and effects, is durable, self-sustained, illimitable, undecaying, and stable, devoid of sound or touch, and possessing neither color nor form, endowed with the three gunas in equilibrium. It is the mother of the world without beginning, and that into which all that is produced is resolved. By that principle, all things were invested in the period subsequent to the last dissolution of the universe and prior to the next creation. For Brahman has learned in the Vedas and teaching truly their doctrines, explain such passages as the following as intending the production of the chief principle of Pradhana. And he quotes the Vedas. There was neither day nor night, nor sky nor earth, nor darkness nor light, nor any other things save only one, unapprehensible by intellect, or that which is Brahma and Puman, um, spirit and matter. The two forms which are other than the essence of unmodified Vishnu are Pradhana, matter, and Purusha, spirit. And his other form by which those two are connected or separated is called Kala, or time. When discrete substance is aggregated in crude nature, as in, as in a foregone dissolution, that dissolution is termed prakrata, or an elemental dissolution. The deity as time is without beginning, and his end is not known. And from him, the revolutions of creation, continuance, and dissolution unintermittingly succeeds. Or when, in the latter season, the equilibrium of the gunas exists in pradhana, and the Puman, or spirit, is detached from matter, um, then where does the form of Vishnu, which is time, abide? Then the Supreme Brahma, the Supreme Soul, the substance of the world, the Lord of all creatures, the universal soul, the Supreme Ruler, Hari, of his own will having entered into matter and spirit, agitated the mutable and immutable principles, the season of creation being arrived in the same manner as fragrance affects the mind from its proximity merely, and not from any immediate operation upon mind itself. So the Supreme influenced the elements of creation. Purushottama is both the agitator and the thing to be agitated, being present in the essence of matter, both when it is contracted and expanded. Vishnu, supreme over the supreme, is of the nature of discrete forms in the atomic productions, Brahma and the rest, gods, humans, etc. Then from that equilibrium of the qualities of, uh, in Pradhana, presided over by soul, um, and when we say presided over by soul, presided over by Kshetragnya, embodied spirit. The spirit which embodies the equilibrium of the gunas. Proceeds the unequal development of those gunas, constituting the principle of Mahat at the time of creation. Um, because as in full agreement with the Bhagavatam, it is when the equilibrium of the gunas is broken that um, forms manifest. The chief principle then invests that great principle intellect, and it becomes threefold, as affected by the gunas of sattva, rajas, or tamas, and invested by the chief principle, matter, as seed is by its skin. From the great principle, mahat, intellect, threefold egotism, ahankara, denominated vaikarika ahankara, or the pure ego, Tejasa ahankara, the passionate, and bhutadi, or rudimental ahankara, is produced, 
according to whether a sattva, a rajas, or a tamas predominates in it. The origin of the subtle elements and of the organs of sense invested in consequence of its three gunas by intellect, as intellect is by the chief principle. Elementary egotism, or bhuta di ahankara, then becoming productive as the rudiment of sound produced from its ether, of which sound is the characteristic, investing it with its rudiment of sound. Ether becoming productive engendered the rudiment of touch, whence originated strong wind, the property of which is touch. And ether, with the rudiment of sound, enveloped the rudiment of touch. Then wind becoming productive produced the rudiment of form or color, as in apparent form, visual form, whence light or fire proceeded, of which form or color is the attribute, and the rudiment of touch enveloped the wind with the rudiment of color. Light becoming productive produced the rudiment of taste, whence proceed all juices in which flavor resides, and the rudiment of color invested the juices with the rudiment of taste. The waters becoming productive engendered the rudiment of smell, whence an aggregate of what is called earth in an elemental sense originates, of which smell is the property. In each of the several elements resides its peculiar rudiment, thence the property of tanmatra, type or rudiment, is ascribed to these elements. Rudimental elements, the tanmatras, are not endowed with qualities, by which we mean gunas, they are not endowed with gunas, and therefore they in themselves are neither soothing, nor agitating, nor stupefying. They are neither sattvic, nor rajasic, nor tamasic. This is the elemental creation proceeding from the principle of ahankara affected by the tamoguna. The organs of sense are said to be the passionate producers of the same principle. By passionate, we mean rajasic, affected by tamas. And the 10 divinities proceed from egotism, from ahankara, affected by the guna of sattva, as does mind, which is the 11th divinity. Um, these 10 divinities being um, Dis, the deity presiding over space, Air, the sun, Prachetas, the Ashvins, Agni, Indra, Upendra, Mitra, and Ka, or Prajapati, uh, presiding over the senses and also over the ear, skin, eye, tongue, nose, speech, hands, feet, and excretory and generative functions of every living being. The organs of sense are 10. Of the 10, five are the skin, eye, nose, tongue, and ear, the objects of which combined with the intellect is the apprehension of sound and the rest. The organs of excretion and procreation, the hands, the feet, and the voice form the other five, of which excretion, generation, manipulation, motion, and speaking are the several acts or functions. Then ether, air, fire, water, and earth, severally united with the properties of sound and the rest, existed as distinguishable according to their gunas as sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic, but possessing various energies and being unconnected, they could not without combination create living beings, not having blended with each other. Having combined therefore with one another, they assumed through their mutual association, the character of one mass of entire unity being the universe with all its contents. And from the direction of spirit, with the acquiescence of the indiscreet principle, intellect and the rest, to the gross elements inclusive, formed an egg, which gradually expanded like a bubble of water. This egg, O sage, compounded of the elements and resting on the waters, was the excellent natural abode of Vishnu in the form of Brahma. And there Vishnu, the Lord of the universe, whose essence is inscrutable, assumed a perceptible form, and even he himself abided in it in the character of Brahma. Its womb, vast as the mountain Meru, was composed of the mountains, and the mighty oceans were the waters that filled its cavity. In that egg, O Brahman, were the continents and seas and mountains, the planets and divisions of the universe, the gods, the demons, 
and humankind. And this egg was externally invested by seven natural envelopes of fire, air, uh, water, air, fire, ether, and a hankara, the origin of the elements, each tenfold the extent of that which it invested. Next came the principle of intelligence, and finally the whole was surrounded by the indiscreet principle, resembling thus the coconut, filled ulteriorly with pulp and exteriorly covered by husk and rind. Affecting then the quality of activity, Hari, the Lord, in other words, the Rajoguna, Hari, the Lord of all, himself becoming Brahma, engaged in the creation of the universe. Vishnu, with the Sattvaguna, and of immeasurable power, preserves created things through successive ages, until the close of the period termed the Kalpa, when the same mighty deity, Janardana, invested with the quality of Tamas, assumes the awful form of Rudra and swallows up the universe. Having thus devoured all things and converted the world into one vast ocean, the Supreme reposes upon his mighty serpent couch amidst the deep. He awakes after a season, and again as Brahma becomes the author of creation. Thus the one and only God, Janardana, takes the designation of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva accordingly as he creates, preserves, or destroys. Vishnu as creator creates himself. As preserver, preserves himself. As destroyer, destroys himself at the end of all things. This world of earth, air, fire, water, ether, the senses, and the mind, all that is termed spirit, that also is the Lord of all elements, the universal form and imperishable. Hence, he is the cause of creation, preservation, and destruction, and the subject of the vicissitudes inherent and elementary nature. He is the object and author of creation. He preserves, destroys, and is preserved. He, Vishnu, as Brahma, and as all other beings, is infinite form. He is the supreme, the giver of all good, the fountain of all happiness. Chapter 3. Maitreya said, How can creative agency be attributed to that Brahma who is without qualities, illimitable, pure, and free from imperfection? Parashara said, The essential properties of existent things are objects of observation of which no foreknowledge is attainable, and creation and hundreds of properties belong to Brahma as inseparable parts of his essence, as heat, O chief of sages, is inherent in fire. Hear then how the deity Narayana, in the person of Brahma, the great parent of the world, created all existent things. Brahma is said to be born, a familiar phrase to signify his manifestation, and as the peculiar measure of his presence, a hundred of his years is said to constitute his life. That period is also called Param, and the half of it Parardham. I have already declared to you, O sinless Brahman, that time is a form of Vishnu. Hear now how it is applied to measure the duration of Brahma and of all other sentient beings, as well as of those which are unconscious, as the mountains, the oceans, and the like. O best of sages, 15 twinklings of the eye make a kashta, 30 kashtas, one kala, and 30 kala, uh, 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 30 kalas, one muhurta, um, which to just give a reference to our um, modern units of time, a muhurta is 48 minutes. 30 muhurtas constitute a day and night of mortals. 30 such days make a month divided into two half months. Six months form an ayana, which is the period of the sun's progress north or south of the ecliptic. Um, in other words, from solstice to solstice, and two ayanas compose one year. The southern ayana is a night of the devas, and the northern ayana is a day of the devas. 12,000 divine years, each composed of 360 such days, constitute the period of the four yugas. They are thus distributed. The Krita yuga 
has 4,000 daiva years, the Treta, 3,000, the Dvapara, 2,000, and the Kali Yuga, 1,000. So those acquainted with antiquity have declared. And again, recall, these are measurements being given in daiva years, each daiva year being 360 Earth years. The period that precedes a yuga is called a sandhya, and it is of as many hundred years as there are thousands in the yuga. In other words, 10% um, as long as the following entire yuga. And the period that follows a yuga, termed the sandhyansha, so sandhya literally means the morning twilight, sandhyansha, the evening twilight of a yuga, is of the same duration. The interval between the sandhya and the sandhyansha is the yuga, denominated krita, treta, etc. The krita, treta, dvapara, and kali together constitute a maha yuga, or aggregate of four yugas. 1,000 such aggregates are one day of Brahma, and 14 manus reign one after the next within that term. Here the division of time which they measure. Seven rishis, the septa rishis, certain secondary divinities, Indra, Manu, and the kings and his sons, and the kings his sons, are created and perish at one period, and the interval called a manvantara, is equal to 71 times the number of years contained in the four yugas with some additional years. In other words, it doesn't divide evenly. It's a slight fraction. This is the duration of the manu, the attendant divinities of the manvantara and the rest, which is equal, one manvantara, to 852,000 daiva years or to 306,720,000 years of mortals independent of the additional period. Um, in other words, those are rounded figures. 14 times this period constitutes a day of Brahma, um, the term Brahma being the derivative form. At the end of this day, a dissolution of the universe occurs when all the three worlds, earth and the regions of space are consumed with fire. The dwellers of Maharloka, the region inhabited by the saints who survived the death of the world, distressed by the heat of Satyaloka burning below them, repair then to Janaloka, um, a higher region of holy souls. When the three worlds below are but one mighty ocean, Brahma, who is one with Narayana, satiate with the demolition of the universe, sleeps upon his serpent bed, contemplated the lotus born by the ascetic inhabitants of the Janaloka for a night of equal duration with his day, at the close of which he creates anew. Of such days and nights is a year of Brahma composed of, of 360 such days and nights. And a hundred such years constitute his whole life. One Paradha, or half his existence, has already expired, terminating with the Mahakalpa called Padma, the Padma Kalpa, um, which was described, of course, in the Padma Purana. The Kalpa, or day of Brahma, termed Varaha, is the rest of the second period of Brahma's existence, described in the Vishnu Purana. Chapter 4. Maitreya said, tell me, mighty sage, how in the commencement of the present Kalpa, Narayana, who is named Brahma, created all existent things. Parashara replied, in what manner the divine Brahma, who is one with Narayana, created progeny and is thence named Prajapati, the lord of progeny, the lord god, you shall hear. At the close of the past kalpa, the Padma kalpa, the divine Brahma, endowed with the quality of goodness, the Sattva guna, awoke from his night of sleep 
and beheld the universe void. He, the supreme Narayana, the incomprehensible, the sovereign of creatures, invested with the form of Brahma, the god without beginning, the creator of all things, of whom with respect to his name Narayana, the god who has the form of Brahma, the imperishable origin of the world, of him this verse is repeated. The waters are called Nara because they were the offspring of Nara, the Supreme Spirit. And as in them, his first or Ayana progress in the character of Brahma took place, he is thence named Narayana, um, the one whose place of moving was the waters. He, the Lord, concluded that within the waters lay the earth, and being desirous to raise it up, created another form for that purpose. And as in preceding kalpas, he had for this purpose assumed the shape of a fish or a turtle. So in this kalpa, he took the figure of a boar, hence the kalpa being termed the varaha kalpa. Having adopted a form composed of the yagnas of the Vedas for the preservation of the whole earth, the eternal supreme and universal soul, the great prajapati of created beings, eulogized by Seneca and the other saints who dwell in the, uh, in the sphere of Janaloka. He, the supporter of spiritual and material being, plunged into the ocean. The goddess Earth, beholding him thus descending to the subterranean regions, bowed in devout adoration and thus glorified the god. Prithvi, the Earth Mother, said, Hail to you who are all creatures, to you the holder of the mace and shell, Elevate me now from this place, as you have upraised me in days of old. From you have I proceeded, of you do I consist, as do the skies and all other existing things. Hail to you, spirit of the supreme spirit, to you, soul of soul, to you who are discrete and indiscreet matter, who are one with the elements and with time. You are the creator of all things, their preserver and their destroyer, in the forms, O Lord, of Brahma, Vishnu, and Rudra, at the seasons of creation, continued duration, and dissolution. When you have devoured all things, you repose on the ocean that sweeps over the world, meditated upon, O Govinda, by the wise. No one knows your true nature, and the gods adore you only in the forms it has pleased you to assume. They who are desirous of final liberation worship you as the supreme Brahman, and who that adores not Vasudeva shall obtain emancipation. Whatever may be apprehended by the mind, whatever may be perceived by the senses, whatever may be discerned by the intellect, all is but a form of you. I am of you, upheld by you. You are my creator, and to you I fly for refuge. Hence, in this universe, Madhavi is my designation. Triumph to the essence of all wisdom, to the unchangeable, the imperishable, Triumph to the eternal, to the indiscreet, to the essence of discrete things, to him who is both cause and effect, who is the universe, the sinless Lord of Yajna, triumph. You are Yajna, you are the oblation, you are the mystic Omkara, you are the sacrificial fires, you are the Vedas and their dependent science. You are Hari, the object of all worship. The sun, the other stars, the planets, the whole world, all that is formless or that has form, all that is visible or invisible, all Purushottama that I have said or left unsaid, all this supreme you are. Hail to you again and again. Hail, all hail. Parashara said, the auspicious supporter of the world being thus hymned by the earth emitted a low murmuring sound like the chanting of the Sama Veda and the mighty boar whose eyes were like a lotus and whose body vast as the blue mountain, was of the dark color of lotus leaves, uplifted upon his ample tusks the earth from the lowest regions. As he reared up his head, the waters shed from his brow purified the great sages Sanandana and others residing in the sphere of the saints. Through the indentations made by his hoofs, the waters rushed into the lower worlds with a thundering noise. Before his breath, the pious denizens of Janaloka were scattered, and the Muni sought for shelter among the bristles upon the scriptural body of the boar. So described because his body is made of the Vedas. Trembling as he rose up, supporting the earth and dripping with moisture. 
then the great sages Sanandana and the rest, residing continually in the sphere of saints, were inspired with delight, and bowing low, they praised the stern-eyed upholder of the earth. The yogis said, Triumph, Lord of Lords Supreme, Keshava, Sovereign of the Earth, the wielder of the mace, the shell, the discus, and the sword, cause of production, destruction, and existence. You are, O oh God, there is no other supreme condition but you. You, Lord, are the person of Yajna, for your feet are the Vedas, your tusks are the stake to which the sacrifice is bound, in your teeth are the offerings, your mouth is the altar, your tongue is the fire, and the hairs of your body are the sacrificial grass. Thine eyes, O Omnipotent, are day and night. Your head is the seat of all, the place of Brahma. Your mane is all the hymns of the Vedas. Your nostrils are all oblations. O you whose snout is the ladle of oblation, whose deep voice is the chanting of the Sama Veda, whose body is the hall of sacrifice, whose joints are the different ceremonies, and whose ears have the properties of both voluntary and obligatory rites. Do you who are eternal, who are in size a mountain, be propitious. We acknowledge you who has traversed the world, O universal form, to be the beginning, the continuance, and the destruction of all things. You are the supreme God. Have pity on us, O Lord of conscious and unconscious beings. The orb of the earth is seen seated on the tip of your tusks, as if you had been, as if you had been sporting amid a lake where the lotus floats, and had borne away the leaves covered with soil. The space between heaven and earth is occupied by your body, O you of unequaled glory, resplendent with the power of pervading the universe, O Lord, for the benefit of all. You are the aim of all. There is none other than you, sovereign of the world. This is your might, by which all things, fixed or movable, are pervaded. This form, which is now beheld, is your form as one essentially with wisdom. Those who have not practiced devotion conceive erroneously of the nature of the world. The ignorant, who do not perceive that this universe is of the nature of wisdom and judge of it as an object of perception only, are lost in the ocean of spiritual ignorance. But they who know true wisdom and whose minds are pure, behold this whole, wor this whole world as one with divine knowledge, as one with you, O God. Be favorable, O universal spirit. Raise up this earth for the habitation of created beings. Inscrutable deity whose eyes are like lotuses, grant us felicity. O Lord, you are endowed with the sattva guna. Raise up, Govinda, this earth for the general good. Grant us happiness, O lotus-eyed. May this, your activity in creation, be beneficial to the earth. Salutation to you. Grant us happiness, O lotus-eyed. Parashara said, the supreme being, thus eulogized, upholding the earth, raised it quickly and placed it on the summit of the ocean where it floats like a mighty vessel and from its expansive surface does not sink beneath the waters. Then, having leveled the earth, the great eternal deity divided it into portions by mountains. He who never wills in vain, created by his irresistible power, those mountains uh, again upon the earth, which had been consumed at the destruction of the world. Having then divided the earth into seven great portions or continents as it was before, he constructed in like manner the four spheres above of earth, sky, heaven, and the sphere of the sages, Maharaloka. Thus Hari, the four-faced God, invested with the quality of, of activity, the Rajoguna, and taking the form of Brahma, accomplished the creation. But he, Brahma, is only the instrumental cause of things to be created. The things that are capable of being created arise from nature as a common material cause. With the exception of one instrumental cause alone, there is no need of any other cause. For imperceptible substance becomes perceptible substance according to the powers with which it is originally imbued. In other words, Brahma does not create each thing manually and consciously. It is the nature of things to be. He's just that which gives it all its impetus. And it all starts up again because the cycles of karma go back through all the past kalpas, back infinitely far without beginning. Um, all of the things 
naturally tend to exist. And so they don't all need to be created in, in, all, in full detail manually by him. He just sets the, sets the wheel turning again and it turns by itself. Chapter five, Maitreya said, now unfold to me, O Brahman, how this deity created the gods, sages, prajapatis, demons, humans, animals, trees, and the rest that abide on earth, in heaven, or in the waters. How Brahma at creation made the world with the gunas, the characteristics and the forms of things, um, that which is called the first creation. Prashara said, I will explain to you, Maitreya, listen attentively, how this deity, the Lord of all, created the gods and other beings. Whilst he, Brahma, formerly, in the beginning of the Kalpas, was med meditating on creation, there appeared a creation beginning with ignorance and consisting of darkness. From that great being appeared fivefold ignorance, consisting of obscurity, illusion, extreme illusion, gloom, and utter darkness. The creation of the creator, thus plunged in abstraction, was the fivefold immovable world without intellect, without intellect or reflection, void of perception or sensation, incapable of feeling, and destitute of motion. Since immovable things were first created, this is called the first creation. Brahma, beholding that it was defective, designed another, and whilst he thus meditated, the animal creation was manifested, to the products of which the term tiryaksrotas is applied from their nutriment following a winding course. They were called beasts, etc., and their characteristic was the tamoguna, they being destitute of knowledge, uncontrolled in their conduct, and mistaking error for wisdom, being formed of egotism and self-esteem, laboring under 28 kinds of imperfection, manifesting inward sensations and associating with each other according to their kinds. Beholding this creation also imperfect, Brahma again meditated, and a third creation appeared, abounding with the guna of sattva, termed urdhvasrotas. The beings thus produced in the urdhvasrotas creation were endowed with pleasure and enjoyment, unencumbered internally or externally, and luminous within and without. This, termed the creation of the immortals, was the third performance of Brahma, who, although well pleased with it, still found it incompetent to fulfill his end. Continuing, therefore, his meditations, there sprang in consequence of his infallible purpose, the creation termed arvaksrotas from indiscreet nature. The products of this are termed arvaksrotasas from the downward current of their nutriment. Um, in other words, bipeds, such as humans. They abound with the light of knowledge, but the gunas of tamas and of rajas predominate in them. Hence, they are afflicted by evil, and are repeatedly impelled to action. They have knowledge both externally and internally, and are the instruments of accomplishing the object of creation, the liberation of the soul. These creatures were humankind. I have thus explained to you, excellent Muni, six creations. The first creation was that of Mahat, or intellect, which is also called the creation of Brahma. The second was that of the rudimentary principles, the Tanmatras, thence termed the Bhuta Sarga, the elemental creation. The third was the modified form of egotism termed the organic creation or creation of the senses, the aindriyaka creation. These, th these three were the prakraka creations, the developments of indiscreet nature preceded by the indiscreet principle. The fourth or fundamental creation of perceptible things was that of inanimate bodies. The fifth, the teriyagyonya creation was that of animals the creation of bodies that were born from wombs or from eggs or embryos that grow and live biological life. The sixth was the Ordhasrotas creation of that of the divinities. The creation of the Arvaksrotas beings was the seventh and was that of humanity. There is an eighth creation termed Anugraha, which possesses both the gunas of sattva and tamas. Of these creations, five are secondary and three are primary. But there is a ninth, the Kaumara creation, which is both primary and secondary. These are the nine creations of the great Prajapati of all, and both as primary and secondary are the radical causes of the world proceeding from the sovereign creator. 
What else dost you desire to hear? Maitreya said, you have briefly related to me, Muni, the creation of the gods and other beings. I am desirous, chief of sages, to hear from you a more detailed account of the creation. But Ashara said, created beings, although they are destroyed in their individual forms at the periods of dissolution, yet being affected by the good or evil acts of former existence, they are never exempted from their consequences, even when demanifested. And when Brahma creates the world anew, they are the progeny of his will in the fourfold condition of gods, humans, animals, or inanimate things. Brahma then, being desirous of creating these four orders of beings, termed devas, asuras, prajapatis, and manavas, collected his mind into itself. Whilst thus concentrated, the guna of tamas pervaded his body, and thence the asuras were first born, issuing from his thigh. Brahma then abandoned that form which was composed of the tanmatra of darkness, and which, being deserted by him, became one with the night. Continuing to create, but assuming a different shape, he experienced pleasure, and thence from his mouth proceeded the devas, endowed with the guna of sattva. This, this form, abandoned by him, became the day in which the sattva guna predominates. Um, and hence, by day, the devas are most powerful, and by night, the asuras. He next adopted another person in which the tanmatra, the rudiment of goodness or sattva also prevailed and thinking of himself as the father of the world, the progenitors, the pitris or ancestors were born from his side. The body, when he abandoned it, became the sandhya, the um, evening twilight, the interval between day and night when the ancestors are closest to us. Brahma then assumed another person pervaded by the guna of rajas, and from this humans in whom rajas, passion, predominates were produced. Quickly abandoning that body, it became morning twilight or the dawn when humans awake and arise and are spurred to activity. At the appearance of this light of day, men feel most vigor, while the prajapatis are most, or sorry, the, the progenitors in the sense in this case of pitris are most powerful in the evening twilight. In this manner, Maitreya, Jyotsnya, the dawn, Ratri, the night, Ahar, the day, and Sandhya, the evening, are the four bodies of Brahma cast off by him one after another, invested by the three gunas in different combinations or predominances. Next from Brahma, in a form composed of the guna of Rajas, was produced hunger, of whom anger was born. And the god put forth in darkness beings emaciate with hunger, of hideous aspects and with long beards. Those beings hastened to the deity. Such of them as exclaimed, O preserve us, were thence called rakshasas, while others who cried out, let us eat, were denominated from that expression, yakshas. Since rakshasas literally means, uh, it, raksha means protection, and yaksha literally means eaters or devourers. Beholding them so disgusting, the hairs of Brahma were shriveled up and first falling from his head were again renewed upon it. From their falling, they became serpents called Sarpa from their creeping and Ahi because they had deserted the head. The creator of the world being incensed then created fierce beings who were denominated goblins, bhutas, malignant fiends and eaters of flesh. The Gandharvas were next born. Imbibing melody, drinking of the goddess of speech, they were born and thence their appellation. The divine Brahma, influenced by their material energies, having created these beings, made others of his own will. Birds he formed from his vital vigor, sheep from his breast, goats from his mouth, kine from his belly and sides, and horses, elephants, sarabhas, gavayas, deer, camels, mules, antelopes, and other animals from his feet, whilst from the hairs of his body sprang herbs, roots, and fruits. The foremost of the Brahmanas, Brahma having created in the commencement of the Kalpa various plants, employed them in sacrifices in the beginning of the Treta Yuga. Animals were distinguished into two classes, domestic animals who lived in villages and wild animals who lived in forests. The first class contained the cow, the goat, the hog, the sheep, the horse, the ass, the mule. The latter, all beasts of prey and many animals with cloven hoofs, the elephant and the monkey. The fifth order were the birds, the sixth aquatic animals, and the seventh reptiles and insects. From his eastern mouth, Brahma then created the Gayatri Chandas, the Rig Veda, the collection of hymns termed Trivrit, the Ratantara portion of the Samaveda, and the Agnishtoma sacrifice, 
From his southern mouth, he created the Yajurveda, the Trishtub Chandas, the collection of hymns called Panchadsha, the Brahat Sama, and the portion of the Samaveda termed Ukta. From his western mouth, he created most of the Samaveda, the Jayati Chandas, the collection of hymns termed Saptadasha, the portion of the Sama called Vairupa, and the Atiratra sacrifice. And from his northern mouth, he created the Ekavimsha collection of hymns, the Atarva Veda, the Aptoriyama rite, the Anushtub Chandas, and the Vairaja portion of the Sama Veda. In this manner, all creatures, great or small, proceeded from his limbs. The great Prajapati of the world, having termed the Asuras, the, the, the Devas, Asuras, and Pitris, created in the commencement of the Kalpa the Yakshas, Pishachas, Dandharvas, and the troops of Apsaras, the nymphs of heaven. Um, Naras and Kinnaras, um, centaurs, or beings with the bodies of horses mixed with human bodies, um, and Kinnaras with the heads of horses. Rakshasas, birds, beasts, deer, serpents, and all things, permanent or transitory, movable or immovable. Thus did the divine Brahma, the first creator and lord of all, and these things being created, discharged the same functions as they had fulfilled in a previous creation, whether malignant or benign, gentle or cruel, good or evil, true or false, and accordingly as they're actuated by such propensities will be their conduct. And the creator displayed infinite variety in the objects of sense and the properties of living things and in the forms of bodies. He determined in the beginning by the authority of the Vedas, the names and forms and functions of all creatures and of the gods, and the names and appropriate offices of the rishis, as they also are read in the Vedas. In like manner, as the, pro as the produces of the seasons designate in periodical revolution the return of the same season, so do the same circumstances indicate the recurrence of the same yuga. And thus in the beginning of each kalpa does Brahma repeatedly create again the world, possessing the power that is derived from the will to create and assisted by the natural and essential pre-existing faculty of the object to be created. And I think we can stop there for day one of the Vishnu Purana. Finished the first five chapters. Thank you guys Ooh, very much for coming. David. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. It's amazing. Oh, what was the multiplication of the yuga? You know, it's like Sat Yuga 4,000, trade to 3,000, et cetera. But what was it like take times a thousand or something like that? You remember, you know what I'm saying? They're talking from, about the length. From Daiva, Daiva years to human. You mean? Yeah. Times 300, so. times 360. But the thing is, oh, um, yeah. you also have to add plus 20% to include the Yuga, uh, the Yuga Sandhya and the Yuga Sandhyansha. Um, so the Yugas don't run neatly into each other. It's not like Sat Yuga ends, Yajur, uh, uh, sorry, Yajur, Atreta Yuga immediately begins. Um, there, it's a slow transition always. The last 10% of Satyuga is starting to bleed into Treta, and the first 10% of Treta Yuga is tinged with Satya Yuga. It's a very slow transition. Um, and so those, those terms of 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 Daiva years describe only the Yuga proper, where it is not blended with another. But the entire span of time, you have to add plus 20% of that and multiply all of that by 360 to get the earth years. Wow, cool. The end of that is dissolution? Or not, in, it, not in a single what? cycle. The end of that, when the Kali Yuga begins, it, um, there's, there's a destruction of some evil beings on the earth, but there isn't a whole dissolution. The next Satya Yuga begins. Um, dissolution occurs only at the end of a kalpa, at the end of a thousand revolutions of that. A thousand revolutions. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and furthermore, that's only a minor dissolution because that's when Brahma <laughs> sleeps. Um, so if you total up a year of Brahma of 360 <laughs> of those sleeps, and then a hundred of those years of Brahma, eventually Brahma dies. And that's when there is a Mahapralaya, 
a greater dissolution. Whoa. Uh, so there's the cycles get very large if you keep multiplying them up. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. We will continue on next week. Thank you so much. Take good day. I have I have one more question if that's all right. Oh sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Good. Good. Oh, thank you. Uh, what? What? There, Brahma created a race of immortals. Yeah, well, actually several, but yes. And but then he got bored with them, or what? What happened there? Why did he just give up on that project? Oh, he didn't. He cast off his bodies one by one. Um, casting off his bodies basically meant they were independent. He he made this and let it go. Um, so he first created the asuras um, in this particular beginning of the kalpa account. He first created the race of the Asuras, the, uh, the um, deities of the night, essentially, um, uh, um, with a strong predominance of Tamoguna, um, and cast off the body. So he, Brahma creates from his body. Creation grows out of him. Um, it, is, it is the nature of the manifestation that is called Brahma, that creation arises from it. He cast off his body, and that body is the night. He took on a new, new body, created again, created the race of the immortal devas, cast off that body, it is the day. They are the sattvic deities of the day. Um, hmm. And so on did this with the pitris the, of the evening twilight, and humans arose in a similar process um, from his body cast off that became the morning or the dawn. Um, these aren't abandonments per se. They're just this race is ready to exist without him and his, his body cast off becomes the portion of existence that is their natural home and that which gives them impetus that like that asuras wake with the night the way that humans wake with the dawn the way that devas are lively in the fullness of daylight and so on cool yeah i have one Sweet. more question yeah, sure. Go ahead, please. Um, this particular Purana, which you explained, is the one most appropriate for this kalpa, um, is describing the manifestation in terms of the boar, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah, we talked about the boar. Yeah. So I'm confused a bit because I thought in a previous um, discourse of your own, uh, it was mentioned that the manifestation of Vishnu at this time is that of the dwarf. That's in the present Manvantara. Um, so within a kalpa... And, go ahead. Yeah. So within any given kalpa, there are many Manvantaras, uh, about 71.4. Um, within our present Manvantara, the aspect of Vishnu who presides over the Manvantara is Vamana Deva. Um, but so it, it, it depends on whether you're talking about the one presiding over the present Kalpa or the one presiding over the present Manvantara. So it's like a difference between an hour versus a whole day versus. Yeah. 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 There, there's there's, there's, there's seven, like 71.4 Manvantaras per Kalpa. The present Manvantara is presided over by Vamana, the present Kalpa is presided over by Varaha. I could make a facetious joke that we're very protected. <laughs> we have multiple layers of oh, yeah. presiding of deities. Yeah. At any given time, there's the, the, all the deities presiding over the present. The deities of the Yuga Dharma, the deities of the Manvantara, the deity of the Kalpa, and so on. There's many, many layers. Yeah. And then the seven Septarishis. Yeah, the, the Septarishis also change office each Manvantara. Each manvantra. Okay. They don't all change each time. Like sometimes three of them will stay the same, but oh, okay. like the, the seats. Oh, yes, I remember seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. But like this, the seats of the Septarishis in theory become open again, and it is refigured out who is going to fill them for that manvantra. They don't always replace all seven, but they all they, they change at the conjunction of each manvantra. And each manvantra 
there's 71.4 in a culpa. So how <laughs> my, my silly little intellect is trying to grasp this. Sure. How does the transition how many, work on the how edge many of the culpa? Deva years is a manvantara? Oh, how many Deva years is a manvantara? Um, well, I would have to do the math a lot. Let's see, Kali Yuga is a thousand Deva years. Um, so how many Manvantras would be in Kali Yuga, for example? Oh, Kali Yuga, many revelations of Yuga fit into one Manvantara. Um, many revelations. Oh, so many revelations of Yugas fit into a Manvantra? 14, uh, I believe. Well, of the, no. the cycle of four. I would have to take a minute to do the math to answer this question properly. Um, how many deva, deva years in a manvantara? Um, 852,000 deva years per manvantara. Um, so 71 cycles of the four yugas in a single manvantara. So there's yugas, manvantras, and kalpas, or did you? Yes, and then there are- um, Oy vey, sorry. <laughs> it, it keeps going even beyond that. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's larger cycles as well, but yes, essentially. And all this is just one aspect of, Kalpa, one aspect, I mean, one aspect of time, which is one aspect of the divine, because you talked about discrete, indiscrete time and. Yeah, that time space. itself is a manifestation of Ishvara, here described as Vishnu. Wow, yes. wow, 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 wow. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ever expanding. Yeah. Beautiful. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, yep. guys. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming. Haribo. Haribo. Haribo.